All right, today I'm gonna to walk you through how you will be using a compass to help find the epicenter. How can you locate the epicenter of an earthquake? Now we did this in class. We began it at least. It is going to be expected that you know how to do this. And we'll do this for the next couple of class periods uh, once or twice and you'll get the hang of it. Uh, essentially we're looking within the earth. Remember earthquakes take place typically within the earth itself. So we've got obviously the, the uh, Lithosphere involves the crust in the upper mantle. We've got this moho zone. We'll learn more about that as we uh, learn more about the infrastructure of the Earth. But here we've got the, the focus is the location where the rock moves or slippage. And the epicenter is the point above the location above where we find it on land. So the epicenter is a key term. This is where it's located on land, uh, on the surface of the Earth, directly above the focus itself. And um, the energy or, or the forms of shock waves that are given off are the result of the earthquake itself. So let me give you a simplified sketch. So the fault, right, there's slippage, rock moves. And that's kind of the purpose of, of what we're talking about with the, with the focus. The focus is the point of the slippage or where the rock moves. So if I call this point X or location X, and this takes place, here's, here's my lithosphere. I'm just making sure we, we define this as the crust and the upper mantle. This, is, this here together is my lithosphere. And that's the, the rock layer. So the epicenter is the location on land. And we're, we're really measuring how these waves are then sent off in all directions. So, so this is kind of what you would see then if you were some city, some location that's near and you had a seismogram that was reading on a seismograph. So this is my my seismogram recording here. And so the first waves that would arrive would be my P waves, my primary waves. And they would begin to oscillate or just kind of begin these blips. And then there would be a little bit of time to where you would, until you would receive the S wave. And the S wave is going to be a larger amplitude than the P wave, right? Remember the P waves travel the fastest, S waves arrive second. You know, they travel the next fastest. And then your surface waves come in. Your surface waves are what are going to do your damage. And you can see this by the amount of amplitude. That's the amount of energy that's, that's going to be rocking this town or city or community, etc. So this is what you would receive at some distance from the earthquake itself. So here's how we can go about solving this. Right? And there's just another picture of the seismograph. And here's a, an example seismogram. So primary waves arrive first, then secondary waves, and then your, um, we're not calling them long waves, we're calling them surface waves. And we'll explain that later. So here's the data. And we solved, we're subtracting times here. So this is a, a, a seismograph reading that tells us that the primary waves arrived at 11.06.06, and the secondary waves, or the S waves, arrived at 11.06.19. And to find the lag time, it's the lag time which is the key piece for us to be able to find the distance away that the earthquake occurred, or the this distance to the epicenter, right? That's the point on land where the earthquake took place, right? It's, it's on land though. The focus is where the actual rock slippage took place. So I come up to lag time of 13 seconds. Here, so that was for Los Angeles. At San Francisco, I have a lag time. I'm taking 1107.18 minus 1106.46, and when I subtract times, I get rid of my six here, excuse me, my seven, it becomes a six, I'm borrowing a minute, therefore I have to add 60 seconds over here. So 60 plus 18 is 78, 78 minus 46 gives me 32 seconds is my lag time. For Salt Lake City, my lag time is 1209.22, right, this is the arrival of my S wave, minus the arrival of my P wave, which is a minute 16, which is 76 seconds. And then lastly, I've got Albuquerque, New Mexico here. I've got 1210.15, the arrival of my P waves, minus 1208.45, the arrival of my, excuse me, S wave minus P wave, which is a minute 30, which is 90 seconds. So now we have these times. We know the lag time, but we don't have anything to refer that to. So we have to now find what the, if we know the velocity. So assuming an average velocity of 3.8 miles per second for the P wave and 2.54 miles per second for the S wave. How long does it take for each type of wave to travel 100 miles? So show your work and how you arrived at this answer. So I, I have a calculation. I'm using velocity equals distance divided by time. And I'm gonna, I know that I want to, it want, we're trying to figure out how long does it take to travel 100 miles? So really I'm solving for t, so I need to isolate my variable t here. So t is gonna equal the distance traveled, which is 100 miles, divided by the velocity of that particular wave. So the time for the P wave to travel 100 miles traveling at a rate of 3.8 miles per second is going to be 
26 seconds. And I've done this just by calculating 100 uh, divided by 3.8. And you come up with 26 seconds. And my time for the S wave to travel 100 miles, right? The distance divided by the velocity, traveling 100 miles, and it's traveling at a rate of 2.54 miles per second, 100 divided by 2.54 is 39 seconds. So what I have here is, it takes 29, or excuse me, 26 seconds to travel, for the P wave to travel 100 miles, and it takes 39 seconds for the S wave to travel 100 miles. So now I can solve, what is the lag time at this distance of 100 miles? Well, the lag time is the difference between the P and the S, so 13 seconds. And as a result of this, I can now use this proportion of I know it takes 13 seconds to travel 100 miles, which I can say uh, to travel 100 miles, it takes 13 seconds. So I have this value, these values here that I can use. I'm setting it simply as a proportion. Now we are assuming that the velocity is going to travel at a constant. Um, it's not going to be changing. But when we're talking short distances, we can assume that. So if now I can set this up and solve. I know that 13 seconds was my lag time for LA, and I know that 13 seconds refers to 100 miles, so this clearly was 100 miles. For Salt Lake City, I can set this up. I know my ratio is 13 seconds over 100 miles, and I know that the lag time for Salt Lake City was 76 seconds, so I can cross multiply and divide. And for San Francisco, I'm going to set it up 13 seconds over 100 miles. I know my lag time was 90 seconds. Remember, x is what I'm going to be solving for. x is going to be in miles of the distance I am away from based on the 13 second to 100 mile ratio. So I'm using it to help me solve my problems. I'm setting them up first. 13 seconds over 100 miles. And it really doesn't matter which way I do. I could do 13 over 100 or I could do, you know, in this case I'll do 100 miles over 13 seconds. Remember, it's just a proportion. Equals x miles over for Albuquerque was 90 seconds. Just making sure my seconds is on the same side as my seconds. So when I calculate this, I can cross multiply. Uh, 76 times 100 divided by 13 gives me about 500 and let's see, 76. I got about 585 miles for San Francisco. Divided by 13 is 692 miles. And for Albuquerque. Oh, excuse me, this one isn't right. This was 692 miles. And for San Francisco, San Francisco, oh, that's my 32 seconds. So 32 seconds times 100 divided by 13 gives me 246. Sorry about that. I put the wrong number down. No biggie. So I've got 246 miles, 585, 100 for LA, and 692 for Albuquerque. Now, Here's what I can do with this information. And this is where you need to, to be able to understand and solve for. I can take these very distances and use a compass and create my compass arcs to solve for where the actual epicenter was. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna use these numbers down here th that I just solved for up here. I'm gonna use my compass and draw compass arcs. So let's see if I can get this to figure out how I can get this to stay. There we go. So LA, 100 miles. I use my scale here. Let me kind of move this up here. You can see it's 100 miles. Bingo, bango. Come on now. Okay, close enough. And I know it's going to take place at some location within this 100 mile. That's a good circle. And then I'm going to use my other distance. Next, next distance, Salt Lake City, San Francisco. I'll go San Francisco. Roughly 250 miles, 250. Find my midpoint here, roughly. Here we go, San Francisco. Make my compass arc. Look at that, ooh, look at that. Looks out very nicely. And I don't actually have to make a full circle at this point because it's gonna be where they intersect, but I don't know which one of these points in which is going to intersect here. So that means I need at least a third one for a triangulate. So I'm gonna use Salt Lake City, 585. That's my number that I got right here, 585. Right there. So. 585, so I had to extend my line down here. If you notice, I, I did this prior. So 585, I'm gonna be pretty darn close, and I would expect you guys to be a little bit closer than I am right now, because um, I'm gonna hold you accountable for more than what I'm doing right now. I'm simply showing you the process. And this here, so what I say, 585 is for Salt Lake City. So I'm gonna use Salt Lake City as my next point, and draw my line, boom. 
notice where these all three are beginning to intersect in this small little area right here. And technically, that would be enough. I know that my intersection, the point of my um, earthquake took place right here. But I'm going to do a fourth one just for the sake of, of doing it. So 692 from Albuquerque. So yeah, I'll be close. 692, we'll call it roughly there. And Albuquerque is going to be, let's see. Here it goes. And yeah, nice. They all kind of intersect right here at this one location. So now, so I just I just did my last compass arc. And if you'll notice that all of these intersect right in this area right here. So if I find here's my point of intersection for three of them, and then here's my fourth one, yeah, it's safe to say that this point right here, that the earthquake, the slippage, took place right in here, and this is likely a function, a result of the San Andreas Fault that was moving. And it clearly just uh, moved at the time in which this took place. And that's what we measured and that's what took place that led to this earthquake that was measured at four different seismic recording stations. There you have it.